Hello and welcome to the nation's flagship political show, Sunday Politics. I'm Kairo Kikulu here in Lagos, sitting in for Sheon Okimbalui. Well, it's the calm night before the legal fireworks begin tomorrow at the Court of Appeal, where all eyes will be on the presidential election petition tribunal. There's been a lot of anticipation and debate around the tribunal, which had its pre-hearing some days back and will officially begin hearing on Monday. What are the laws guiding its conduct? What are the issues at stake? Of course, expectations of Nigerians and ensuring that justice is done, those are some of the issues we'll be looking into tonight. The truth is there's been so much talk about the executive arm of government, but that's not the only leg of a democracy, is it? So as we focus on the executive, we're doing the same for the judiciary. And of course, not forgetting the legislature, right? Speaking of that, the 10th Assembly is still weeks uh, from inaugurating uh, the 10th Assembly, but there's a lot going on behind the scenes, all right? Away from the judiciary for now to the legislature, all right? This week saw a lot of meetings, okay? Endorsements, counter endorsements for the prospective leaders of the 10th Assembly. And I can tell you, there are last minute alignments and consultations going on as I speak to you with reports of certain candidates anointed by the party and the president-elect. So is there really an anointed candidate or candidates for the Senate and the House of Representatives? And how will this anointing break the already existing alignment, or will I say, how will it break the yoke? It's a packed show tonight on Sunday Politics. But let's begin by telling you that the fourth batch of Nigerians returning from the conflict in Sudan arrived in Namdi Azikiwe International Airport in Abuja earlier today. And that brings to a total of 834, the number of evacuees from seven flights in total. But the twist is, they're Nigerians who are still stranded in Sudan. And the government is asking them to make their way to Port Sudan, where Nigeria-bound flights are waiting as evacuations from Aswan in Egypt have officially ended. So that's information uh, for if you have family or for you, if you're watching us right now, that's, uh, well, the directive uh, from the Nigerian government that should be evacuated to Port Sudan, where the airlifting uh, will happen away from the Aswan uh, airport in Egypt. That aside for now, let's talk politics tonight. The ruling APC is determined to produce the leaders of the coming 10th Assembly. Well, it still has more members than any single party in both chambers of the legislature, but it has to rely on the other parties, particularly in the House of Reps, OK? Remember what played out in the 8th Assembly? Well, it looks like the party is up against a similar scenario. There are reports that the party and the president-elect have anointed candidates for a Senate presidency and the speakership. But today saw a twist in that race for the Senate presidency. The Southeast Senate Caucus has now advised the president-elect Bolatinubu to be conscious of what it described as the grave implications of zoning and endorsing a candidate for the position of Senate president from the South South region without any regard for the Southeast. As they say, such move will serve as a recipe for injustice, which they say will culminate into restiveness. Well, this advice is contained in a communique read by Senator Ifan Yuba after a meeting in Abuja. I'd like you to take a listen, then we'll take you back to something that played out earlier in the week and we'll have this conversation. But take a listen to Senator Fanyuba. With the sidelining of the Southeast from producing the presidential candidates of the major political parties before the general election, the only means through which the zone can be compensated and given a sense of belonging is for the zone to produce the next Senate president, as this will restore confidence to the people from the Southeast geopolitical zone. The APC must rise above primordial and political interest and shun the winner-take-all syndrome and pursue ethno-religious inclusivity and a strong, virile, united, progressive, prosperous, equitable, and just democratic nation. Mr. President-elect, should Mr. Mr. President-elect, how would an average woman feel after seeing evidence of total discrimination? The South East have been denied the chance to produce the president to produce the president of Nigeria since 1966. The South South has produced president for six years, 
and also had deputy senior president in the outgoing administration. The only zone in the south that has not been favored is the southeast. The outcry of marginalization of the southeast and the entire Igbo should be addressed by the incoming administration rather than aggravating it. So this is interesting because just some days ago, a senator-elect from the southeast, that's Governor Dave Omai of Eboy State, had actually stepped down for Senator Godzilla Kwabio, who is from the south-south and said to be the anointed candidate of the party and the president-elect. So here's what uh, Governor Dave Omai said on Friday evening. Go take a listen now. All right, we'll get that for you, okay? It's just uh, a few buttons to press there. But if you take a look at that briefing uh, from Senator Ofanyu Ba, you'd see that uh, Senator Oju Zokalu was there as well, who is also vying for that position. Uh, part of the people who signed that communique includes uh, Senator Osita Izanaso, who is also vying for that same position of the Senate president. So what exactly is going on? This has raised lots of questions. How well is this plan by the APC to have a consensus candidate? How well is it holding up? Well, let's speak tonight with one of the speakership hopefuls who has been reported to be the party's anointed candidate. Okay, let's get into the realm of things now and just help you understand what is going on. We're joined on the program tonight by a member representing Zaria Federal Constituency in Kaduna State. He is aspiring uh, to be Speaker of the 10th Assembly, his chairman, current chairman, House Committee on Land Transport, and he's said to have sponsored the highest number of bills in the outgoing 9th Assembly, 78 bills and seven motions, with 20 of the bills assented to by President Muhammad Buhari. We have joining us on the program this evening, uh, Honorable Tajuddin Abbas. He joins us live from our Abuja studio. Honorable Abbas, thank you for joining us on Sunday politics. Thank you, Kaede. Good evening to all our viewers. Well, good evening to you too. I mean, we just saw what is playing out in the Senate, but we're coming to the House of Representatives now, the Green Chamber, as it is called. Your name has come up quite a lot in the past few days. So I'd like you to tell Nigerians, demystify this, are you indeed the anointed candidate of your party and the president-elect? Well, what I can tell you, Kayode, is um, each and every contestant for this uh, post of speakership has at one time or the other visited the president-elect and uh, also visit uh, members of the LWC for their blessing and support. I, just like uh, most of them, had caused to visit the president-elect last week to present myself, to introduce myself, and to also inform him of my aspiration to be the speaker of the 10th Assembly. We had uh, very engaging discussions with him. At the end of the day, I can tell you he was very happy with my candidature. He, pro uh, he prayed for me and also told me that um, he would do everything possible to ensure that if it is not worse, that this particular position is on he'll do his best to ensure that justice and fairness uh, has been done to all the contestants. That's all I can tell you. Uh, since the announcement has not been made as to who is the candidate of the party, I'm sure that question will be squarely and better answered by the party chairman and the NWC, which hopefully by next week, uh, we are told, they will sit and deliberate and come up with uh, the final decision. Right. I, I'm sure you've seen those reports making the rounds. I mean, some of them breaking news, putting your name, your picture as that anointed one. In fact, a lot of people thought it is done and dusted. So you're saying to us now that that is not the case. Well, I am not saying that um, it is not the case. What I'm saying is that there is no any official pronouncement from the party who have the exclusive right to announce who the speakership of um, candidate of the 10th Assembly is. So it's not for me to say, this is the man that has been endorsed. We are waiting for the NWC after their meeting tomorrow, hopefully, to come up 
with uh, the name of the candidate both for the Senate and for the House of Reps. Right. I, I mean, a lot of Nigerians will want to know how these things work, because you represent a lot of people, too, from Kaduna State. And a lot of Nigerians will want to understand exactly what factors came to play as such that the president-elect offered you prayers and offered you his support. What is What did, do you think he found special about you? Well, I want to believe, first and foremost, he is impressed with my legislative uh, contributions. I have told him I've been in the National Assembly since 2011, and I've been there now for almost 12 years back to back, and I've uh, contributed in sponsoring a lot of bills, out of which uh, in the Eighth Assembly, I sponsored uh, 43 bills, which gave me the number one ranking in terms of those who sponsored bills. And in the Ninth Assembly, I had the singular honor of sponsoring 74 bills, and uh, out of them, 21 have been assented by Mr. President, and there are now laws in the country. And beside that, I went uh, uh, again to tell him where I come from, uh, my academic background, that I was a teacher in primary school. I was uh, head of accounting department of a polytechnic in 1989 to 1993. I was also a head of banking and finance of a polytechnic again between 2003 to 2005. I was the founding head of accounting department of Kaduna State University. I told him my private sector experience that I was a marketing manager with a Nigerian tobacco company, which is now called British American Tobacco. And uh, I told him my journey there uh, up to the time when I became a general manager of a subsidiary company before I resigned and uh, went back to the classroom in 2001. Uh, he is impressed with uh, the credentials, my place, the places that I have worked, particularly in the public and the private sector, and also my modest contributions in the National Assembly. I'm sure whatever makes him to say he is happy with me is probably because of those uh, experiences, the qualifications, uh, well, I just want to know, how are you sure that this is not the case for other candidates who have visited him as well? Uh, are you sure that he has not also offered them prayers and their support as he has for you? I believe he has done so, because I know him as a party man. He will not come out outrightly to say he is not supportive of anyone. I'm sure what you will tell each and every contestant that visits him is that he is praying for them, he's praying for the country, let the country choose the best among the contestants, and uh, let us all be good party men to wait for zoning and to wait for whoever the party should decide at the end of the day to be the candidate uh, for the National Assembly. I believe that should be the line that he has done for each and every contestant that uh, is going to visit him. We we'll take a we we'll take a listen to one of your colleagues speaking to this particular issue. But just to be clear, is this like a joint ticket with you and um, Honourable Ben Kalu? Uh, Honourable Abbas, if you can hear Hello? me, can you hear me? Yeah. To the best of my knowledge, I'm not aware. All I know is that. Um, the zoning formula has not been officially released. We don't know, as we are talking, whether the party has conclusively decided that the ticket is going to the Northwest and the deputy, uh, the deputy speaker is going to the Southeast. But we assume if uh, that is the case, perhaps if ben, uh, ben Carlo has come out to talk, maybe he has his own sources, but for me, I am not in the position to actually confirm whether that position has actually been ceded to the Southeast and to him in particular. Uh, I, I understand that you're trying to keep some of these issues hush hush and not reveal too much. To be fair, I mean, it's not Nigerians that will vote on the floor of the House that day. It will be representatives. So Nigerians can only do little, really. Maybe they can impress upon their representatives, but at the end of the day, 
uh, the responsibility lies with the representatives. But let's take a look at the balance of power, uh, Honorable Abbas, because you've talked about mm -hmm. the zoning formula. Let's take a look at what we have so far uh, with the president-elect and the vice president-elect. So as it stands today, the president-elect is from the southwest region uh, of, of the country, right? Mm -hmm. The vice president-elect is from the northeast region. Well, it's not clear what your party uh, will do with the south-south, uh, or rather with the Senate presidents, even though some say it will go to the South-South. Of course, we've heard uh, other senators saying that should not be the case. But if the House of Representatives, the speakership, were to go your way, it will be going to the Northwest. Uh, looking at the way that will look, do you, do you think that will unite Nigerians, really? Do you think that will rally Nigerians to think, OK, at least the regions are represented? Well, what I can tell you, Kayode, is that um, every administration comes with its own challenges, some considerations, some of the factors that uh, the party will take at the end of the day to determine where, what should go to where, uh, relies heavily on the party. There are considerations, there are peculiarities that we may not all know. But what I am sure of, is that the president elect and the party will come up with an acceptable zoning that will be in the mutual interest of each and every Nigerian. What I would want us to do is to wait until when that zoning comes uh, out. I'm sure it will come with a lot of justification from the party why it, is, uh, it has done what it has done. And from there, we'll be able to know the underlying considerations that made the party to zone those pol uh, political positions to wherever. Uh, but, until then, we'll just be talking about speculation. Right. But I but believe speak sincerely for the... that... Um... Okay, uh, you, can you can land on that point, please. Uh, sincerely, I believe at the end of the exercise, every zone, all the six geopolitical zones, will have something to take home. That I can assure you. I know the party will not abandon any region, any zone, for whatever reason. You've made a case for yourself personally, based on your pedigree. You've talked about what you told uh, the president-elect, about your experience, the bills you have passed. I mean, we'll come to some of that in a moment. But speak for your region, the Northwest. Why do you think the Northwest uh, deserves the speakership position? Yeah, for two or three reasons. One, the Northwest region, has seven states, and uh, in the last election, we gave Mr. President more than 2.7 million votes. And in every presidential election, even before now, the region or the zone that gives the highest vote is almost always the Northwest. Uh, secondly, the Northwest has 92 members out of 360, which is almost 26% of the entire members of the House of Reps. Uh, that is one thing that uh, does another factor that needs to be uh, considered. And thirdly, if uh, uh, the president comes from the southwest and the vice president comes from the northeast, if not because of that peculiarity of a Muslim Muslim ticket, I am sure, based on the contribution of the northwest, the Senate president would have been what we would ideally ask for. But because of the peculiarity of uh, our country and the need to balance particularly religious and tribal uh, considerations, we believe that the Senate president should go to the south. And then the uh, speaker of the House of Representatives should come to the northwest. Uh, other regions, uh, uh, zones like the north central, where already they have a chairman, we believe that uh, even if it is stopped at that, at least they have uh, gotten something to take home. Uh, North Central, they already have the chairman, and uh, the zones that have to be considered are the Northwest, the South-South, and the Southeast. So if you look at uh, the contribution of all those zones, you will agree with me that um, the Northwest uh, qualifies more than any other zone to be given the number four position. You know, it's interesting that you know, the, the Muslim Muslim ticket dynamic has come in yet again. Lots of considerations, yes. But some said, well, since it was jettisoned for the president 
and vice president elect. I mean, what's the point of still trying to maintain that? In any case, they say if you want to maintain balance, then the Senate presidency and the speakership should go Christian Christian. So if it's balance you want, it can go that way. Do you agree? Well, I, what I believe is that um, the Senate, if we go back to even the zoning of the 1999, when PDP was in power, you can recall that uh, we have almost the same peculiarity, except uh, for the fact that uh, the president then was a Christian. Uh, the Northeast had the vice president. The Senate president went to the Southeast. The deputy speakership went to the South-South. The Northwest was given uh, the speakership. But if you look at the dynamics then, it was only expedient if you look at uh, the contribution that uh, the party in power then gave from each of these zones, that the justification to give the Senate presidency to the South is, uh, was very cogent. Uh, I think this time around, there are other considerations. Whereas we have a Muslim Muslim with a Southwest person being the president and, the, and being a Muslim and the Northeast uh, a Muslim, uh, we need to also look at uh, the other issues, the bigger picture concerning the result of the presidential election and where all the votes are coming from. Because anyone who tries to ignore the contributions of each of these zones to the presidential election will also not be fair to those zones. So I'm sure um, whatever decision the party will take and the president elect, they will look at what uh, the PDP did in 1999 vis-a-vis -vis the peculiarities that we have today of having a Southwest Muslim and a Northeast Muslim as president and vice president, and the contribution of each of these zones in the last election. I'm well, sure those will be the underlining considerations the party and the president elect will use to determine what goes to where. Well, uh, I, 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 maybe you didn't mention it, but where is the place of healing this nation, which has, I mean, the elections have divided the country across ethnic lines, across religious lines, across party lines, but particularly the religious and ethnic lines. So how really, because you didn't mention it, healing a nation like Nigeria, how would your emergence heal this nation? That's what a lot of people are asking and hoping to hear your party speak to particularly. I can tell you, Kayode, of all the people I met, all the 360 members of the National Assembly, I have not heard of anyone who says taking the speakership to the Northwest will be an injustice to any zone. Everyone unanimously believe that uh, Southwest, uh, Northwest is the rightful place for the speakership. Okay. While I can tell you that people will be very uncomfortable if they hear that the Senate presidency is taken to the Northwest, for obvious reasons, we have mentioned the Muslim-Muslim uh, ticket of the president right. and the vice president. Nobody will uh, take it lightly with this government if the number three position is ceded to a Muslim from the Northwest. But I can assure you, the Northwest is one zone that most stakeholders, if not all, will tell you that um, producing a speaker from there is not a bad idea. Well, some, some have looked at the composition of the um, House of Reps, the 10th, particularly the 10th uh, Assembly, and, I mean, the dynamics are very interesting. There's a group calling itself the Greater Majority. I'm sure you've heard of them. But when you said you spoke to all of them and, you know, those issues weren't quite raised, I'd like you to listen to Honorable Gagdi, who's also in the running, what he said. By the way, he had other reps elect with him. So let's listen in and continue this conversation. Well, okay, if we could just pull if, up uh, uh, Honorable Gagdi. Honorable just, Gagdi. A, just a minute, Honorable Abbas. I'd like you to listen to what Honorable Gagdi said uh, just uh, yesterday, and then I'd like you to respond to Honorable Gagdi. Take a listen to Honorable Gagdi. I urge our president-elect, who is a talent hunter, who is a Democrat, to support the party to zone the, pre the speakership to the north, and in the same spirit of justice, equity, and fairness, 
that was shown in the presidential election of 2023. Let it be zoned to the north and let the north central that have never produced speaker from 1999 till date be given that privilege of justice, equity, and fairness to produce speaker. I am not converging for supporters, lobbyists. That is why I hardly lobby the way other people lobby. I want you, the members elect, to endorse me and to see prospect in me as your speaker of the 10th assembly. But so there's another, uh, well, runner for the position. And well, he says North Central. So is it that you didn't dialogue with him and other reps that are present or were present at that event? Well, what I can tell you is that at this hour, since the party has not zoned to any particular area, every member from whatever zone he's coming from is entitled to come out and aspire. But at the end of the day, the party and the president-elect will look at all the underlying considerations that need to be taken to be able to determine where each of these positions should be taken. But I want to say categorically clear that um, what Orabugadi said, one of the things he said is that the party should be just and fair and equitable to everyone. Now, I take him back to this issue. The present chairman of the party is from North Central. Where is the equity and fairness if the position of speaker is also taken to the North Central? Is there fairness and equity there? Should we have a chairman of the party from North Central, from Nasara, which was carved out of Plateau? He is from Plateau. And then the number four position is also ceded to the same uh, state or to the same zone. Well, I do not think well, that honorable. is fairness, that is equity. Let's, let's, let's wind down on this point. Some people have uh, said that you will not hold uh, the executive accountable. In fact, they think you might be weak and become a robber's stamp. What do you have to say to that? What makes them think that I'm, I'm weak? The fact that um, you don't come out to insult anybody, the fact that you are a team player, you play along with everyone, you live along with everyone in the house, you don't have enemies, you have only friends, the fact that uh, you contribute more than any other uh, member in the Ninth Assembly. You are qualified based on public and private sector experience. Does that make me weak? Look, what people need to understand is to go and look at the pedigree and the antecedents of each and every member. The issue of being robust term is neither here nor there. If you recall in, 19, in 2019, was it not the president-elect then? Muhammad Buhari, that pushed for Femi and the, the Senate President Lawal to become the candidates of the party? Are we saying today, after almost four years, that those people were the robust terms of uh, but, uh, the honorable, executive? I mean, no. can you look the, the president-elect? The National president Assembly elect? is uh, a honorable. very complex Can you look the president-elect in the position? face and tell him that, well, I don't think this policy is right. I don't think this will sit down well with Nigerians. Can you really do that? That's the question. Can you look him in the face and tell him the truth, the hard truth? Kaede, I want you to know that I have come from an academic institution. And not only that I have taught in academic institutions in the past, tertiary institutions, I want you to know that any product that comes and he happened to be a leader there is capable of challenging anybody. At my age, with my pedigree, Believe me, there is no way right. I can compromise on my own principles. There is no way I will allow anyone to compromise the independence of uh, the legislature. All right. Uh, what I want to tell you is that uh, any responsible speaker would want to see a harmonious, a harmonious relationship with the executive. Because living together with a mutual interest... All right will not lead to anything other than progress and prosperity for the country. Well, we Honorable Abbas... We can go back and look at the antecedents of... Uh, yep. 
I, I think that's a great place to leave it uh, because right. of time. But clearly, this is an ongoing conversation. The party is meeting. We'll wait to see the outcome of that. Some have described you at the end as the anointed candidate. So we'll see how that plays out. But we'd like to thank you so, so much, Honorable Tajuddin uh, Bas, who is uh, running for Speaker uh, of the 10th Assembly. Thank you once again for your time and wish you the very best. Thank you so much, Kawede. All the best to all of you there. Thank you so much. All right. Well, coming up next, the presidential election petition tribunal begins hearing tomorrow. The legal fireworks will be unlike anything you've ever seen. We have two senior advocates of Nigeria joining us on the program tonight to prepare us for what's to come. That's in a moment. Please stay with us. Website channelstv.com has more information on our top stories and others. Subscribe and watch Channels Television's live stream on YouTube and other social media platforms using your mobile device browser or download the Channels TV app for Android and iOS devices from their respective stores. You can also watch us via your smart TV platforms on Apple TV, Android TV, Fire TV, and Roku. Channels Television, ubiquitous. Now to the big day tomorrow. The president of the Court of Appeal, Justice Monica Dunker Mensum, is expected to formally unveil members of the presidential election petition tribunal that will adjudicate on all petitions filed against the declaration of Senator Bola Tinubu as a winner of the 2023 presidential elections. A total of five petitions, well, four, but five were filed originally against the victory of President-elect Senator Bola Tinubu in that election. So let's run you through uh, some of them. Well, the Action Alliance AA uh, was the first to petition the declaration of INEC. A faction of the party actually filed the lawsuit, based its argument on the premise that INEC failed to upload the name of its authentic presidential candidate, uh, Solomon David Okanigwan, to its portal for the presidential poll. Ironically, it's a case of first in, first out, as the Action Alliance has filed to withdraw uh, that case uh, that is expected to be decided on. Uh, tomorrow. So we can strike that out effectively. So four left. The next is the Action People's Party uh, petition, the tribunal. The case has, of course, uh, these people, uh, Senator Bola Tinubu, the APC and INEC as uh, respondents. Then, of course, the Labour Party. The Labour Party has its petition. Uh, and Mr. Peter will be, of course, with INEC, Senator Bola Tinubu, Kashim Shatima, his vice, and the APC as the respondents. The third one, is that of the Allied People's Movement, the APM, and it has those lists, INEC, APC, Balatinibu, Kashim Shatima, and adds 
Kabir Masar, you might remember the placeholder conversation. Yeah, that's also in this case. And finally, the People's Democratic Party, PDP, and Atiku Abubakar, again, as the INEC, Bola Tinubu, and the APC as respondents in that very case. So it's billed to be perhaps the biggest election petition this country has seen. It's building up to that one. So let's help you understand what will be playing out in the next few weeks or months, depending on how it goes. We have joining us in the studio two hefty guests, really. I'm, I'm literally facing a panel right here in the studio. Uh, Mr. Kayode Adilola is a senior advocate of Nigeria. He's right here in our Lagos studio. And uh, senior advocate of Nigeria, Adeleke Abola. Gentlemen, thank you for joining us. pleasure to be here. As I said, I feel like I'm in front of a panel. So um, I'm just going to listen a lot, and I'm sure a lot of Nigerians also want to listen and understand. So let's start with your thoughts on this voyage we're about to embark upon. What does this mean for Nigeria and its democracy? I'll begin with you, Mr. Dilola. Um, let's, let's put it this way. We have a situation where members of the electorate or the electorate are very anxious, anxious about what the outcome of the election petitions will be like. Um, a lot of people do not know what the dynamics of election petitions are like. Mm. Um, they don't know what the rules are. But I can tell you that we are in for a, a period which is definite. The Constitution says you have a maximum of 180 days within which the petition must be heard and judgment delivered. And 180 days begins to run from the date the petition is filed. So how many days do we have once we begin to discuss how many days the, the responders have had to file their responses? Then we have a, a, the pre-hearing session which will commence tomorrow. And the pre-hearing period will come, go on for a period of about 14 days. A decision will be taken regarding maybe electoral uh, uh, interlocutory issues, mm. how witnesses will be lined up and uh, taken, if there are documents which they want to look at and determine whether there are issues concerning them. They want to then have timelines because each party will be given the same amount of time within which to prepare their cases or to present their cases. So this is what members of the public should know would happen. So 180 days is the maximum. It is possible that this whole process will go on for less than 180 days, but the chances are very slim because once the, um, uh, the uh, witnesses have been taken, the evidence taken, the um, cross-examinations are taken by the respective counsel, including INEC, then we're going to have the counsel representing the parties filing the briefs of the argument. Then the election tribunal itself requires ample time to look at this evidence, a lot of bond, uh, the bonds of papers before them, the oral evidence given by the, by the witnesses before they, they decide what the decision should be. So this is, in a nutshell, what we should expect from tomorrow. So when you say we're going to have fireworks from tomorrow, trust me, we're going to have fireworks. The fireworks are on. Yes, because the parties also have preliminary objections which have been filed. Mm. Now, preliminary objections will be taken along with the substantive matters because we don't have preliminary objections determined first and then the election petitions determined after that. So we're going to have those things uh, which are complained about on the preliminary objections taken alongside the, the election petition itself. And then it's a whole lot of work. Right. And people should not be unduly anxious. But I can assure you of one thing. When the decision is finally taken, the judges will give reasons for the decisions. So that is what people should look at at the end of the day. Mm. You, you've taken us through, I mean, it's quite lengthy for some of us that are not lawyers. Maybe have gotten lost <laughs> in, in some way, but of course it gives an insight yes. as to what to expect. And for a lot of Nigerians, because this is for Nigerians, yes. we don't know if it will be televised yet, but at least we can prepare the minds of Nigerians uh, for the bits and pieces that will come out. And Mr. Abola, if you can help Nigerians understand just how big a deal this is, or otherwise, I, I don't know how you are seeing it. Well, it's a big deal, because any time a presidential result is challenged, it's always a big deal, because people are anxious, a lot of people are under the mistaken impression as to how cases are conducted. This is one of the special cases where the Court of Appeal is a court of first instance. Ordinarily, 
court of appeal does not listen to evidence. He only takes appeal from case from the high court mm. or court martial. But in this case, it is the one that is going to listen to the evidence by the parties and uh, come to a conclusion. So it's going to be, it depends. This is a case that is more or less driven by the petitioner. It is what the petitioner is the one that has come to court, whether it's a Labour Party, whether it's PDP, whether it's APA. They are the one that will determine how quickly, because it's the issues result. I have listened to some very senior lawyers saying that, oh, this matter can be concluded before May 29, which is just about two weeks away. I can assure you, let us forget about that. That is not going to happen. Unless the only way those matters can be concluded before that time is see the petitioners withdraw their petition and the matter is struck out. So what if the justices work at um, unprecedented speed? Is that is it? It's not possible because, as the learned advocate earlier said, there are procedures. You have preliminary objections, you are going to take evidence. It is, election petition is, if it's only one issue, for example, the issue of whether you require to score 25% of Abuja. That one does not require any evidence. That is just issue of law. If that is the only issue, perhaps it can be concluded, you can finish presenting your case this week. But the judges will still have to consider where, whether, when, when to deliver their judgment. And that is a matter for the judges, depending on the prayer of work they have. Because we are, we are talking about four, five petitions. One may likely be withdrawn tomorrow. The issue really is that it takes time to undo, to listen to all the parties. No matter, there's nothing like a simple case. Because we have the, the Supreme Court has really ruled some years ago that each, when you will allege fraud in an election petition, you must prove it beyond all reasonable doubt. You cannot take examples. And so in Lagos, we have, we have about 13,000 uh, 13, polling, polling units. units. Yes. You must call weaknesses from each polling unit. And that's a huge burden. That's a huge burden. So if you have a thousand witnesses, you remember, even if you still need to stand up and mention their name and see that, you know how long that one will take. So that's why I say, it's the petitioner that will determine how long this will take. Mm. So when we are talking about the process, people should not get too excited at this stage because the case, even tomorrow when you say fireworks, it will just be preliminaries. Tomorrow will just be a sort of record keeping. How do we proceed? How are we going to do it? What are we, which one are we taking first? Which are, because you, can't, you have four or five petitions by the same tribunal. Definitely, you can't have five, but they're not going to be consolidated. But, but they want to make an impression, the lawyers want to make a first no, impression. Impression really at the beginning of a case. We are not, nobody's making any speech tomorrow. The, the only issue will be okay, you have another objection. The judges, the tribunal member may say likely that we are going to hear everything together with the with the main petition. Mm. So let us keep that one in abeyance. I, th I thought there was a pre-hearing, and this is the main hearing that is coming up tomorrow. The, the main, yes, the main, the pre-hearing is about oh, we want time for us to file papers. And that has been concluded. That has been concluded. Right. But now the the the, the preliminary objection itself is part of the main hearing because we are challenging the hearing of the case itself. Likely, as I said, it will be taken together with the main, mm. with the main case. So you have to call witnesses. Unless you, if you say you are not calling witnesses, you always say no on law. That is the only one that can be first. But if you are going to allege fraud, you must call witnesses. You must prove it beyond all reasonable doubt. <sighs> I mean, just thinking about that alone, it's it's huge. But Mr. Dilola, what do we know from history about tribunals, really? Um, especially at this level, we've seen tribunals upturn governorship elections, we've seen them upturn, you know, legislative elections. But what does history tell us really about tribunal? At this stage, what are the possibilities? Let, let me go far back. Um, I recall that when we had the 1979 elections, um, it was the first time I had the opportunity of voting. We had the issue of the 12 2 thirds. That was a very technical point. So technical points may also arise here that we do not anticipate. Aside from that, the council representing these parties, without a doubt in my mind, are 
very well qualified people, experienced in uh, election petitions. And so everyone must dig deep and try to unravel something which is peculiar. It's not going to be run of the mill. So like I said, in the days when we had the, our law versus Shagari election petitions, of course, a lot of people who were the UPN supporters expected that we were going to have the runoff. It didn't happen. So I'm not going to anticipate anything here because I do not know what the council are going to be, uh, the council representing the respective parties are considering. But if we go beyond that, and then we talk about even the recent elections, um, the, current <clears throat> the current president was a participant in four elections before he became president. And on each occasion, he felt he had done his bit. He felt he had all the, all the votes that he needed, mm. but he didn't become president. The election petition tribunal will listen to evidence. We look at also documentary evidence, and that's a lot. They've got a lot of documentary evidence to consider. And when that happens, the outcome will be based upon the evidence and the the oral evidence and documentary evidence, like my learned colleague has just said. The petition, the, the petition presented before them, supported by the evidence, can only be limited to the amount of time given to them. If we have, for example, witnesses from 174 polling, thousand polling units that we had, we would never finish. So election petitions, require a lot of tact, require a lot of resources on the part of the council, but most importantly, with a presidential election, let's, let's be frank here, it's, a, it's an uphill task. Uphill task because for you to demonstrate that the winner has not won, you must, demo, you must prove one of three things. One, that he wasn't qualified to even contest. Two, that he didn't win the, the majority of the vote. Or thirdly, that the, um, the, the, the electoral um, guidelines were not substantially uh, oh. complied with. And how to demonstrate that? So over time, that is what we have had. It is easier when you're discussing or you're talking about election petitions at the governorship level where you're talking about a, a small state. But when it's the presidential election, I'm, I'm going to watch everything going on and I tell you for free that I'm going to be seeing everything that's going on because I want to see what every council is going to be putting on the table for us to see which is peculiar to what we have seen in the past or more than anything else like my learned colleague has said the petition as presented will determine more than anything else. Mm. I wonder if you want to add to that especially what history tells us but you made a point about you would follow up would you want it to be televised? I don't know. Both of you. Would you want it to be televised? I don't well, think we should reduce the court process to a television spectacle. The, our courts are rather conservative when it comes to the issue of, of uh, televising or even allowing the use of even still photography in court. It's only an exceptional circumstance. And uh, in my opinion, the lawyers, with all due respect to them, some of them will start playing to the galleries when they have camera. The issues, perhaps we may wait until the judgment, <coughs> that if the judgment can be televised. But when it comes to the on drum of presenting evidence, it's a very, it can be very boring for those of us who, who go to court every day. It's very little time that is exciting. A lot of times it's things we have gone through so many times. We are, we are calling witnesses. Some of them may not be available. Some of them may be sick. Some of them may collapse in the middle of the giving of evidence. Those are not the kind of things we want to see. I, I think the Niger Nigerians, especially people <coughs> who have called for it, might not just mind. I, I don't know if you agree with him. Well, I, um, I, I differ for these reasons. First of all, the Code of Conduct Tribunal, if you recall, was televised to an extent when the former Chief Justice of uh, Nigeria was, was, you know, appeared before them. Um, it was televised. And then we also had the Oputa panel, which wasn't exactly a court, you know, as such. It was televised. What it might just do is it might give um, citizens who 
think that they just want to see exactly what is going on, an opportunity to observe the proceedings. Maybe, just maybe, at the end of it all, might give them an opportunity to say, well, at least justice was served. Might give them confidence in the yes, judiciary. Yes, it might be a question, of, a, a question of perception. And I think that's, that in the situation in which we are, I think a lot of people want to be convinced that, well, if my candidate didn't win, at least let me see that justice has been served. Mm. Yeah. Uh, clearly, you don't agree with that. But let, let's talk about the point you made about this being a very arduous task. And I had to go through that tautology just to show that it's, it's a huge one. Uh, maybe what is now is not what should be. And I think that's a conversation or a debate that we begin, we're beginning to see now. People saying, well, that duration doesn't quite work, especially because it will be difficult uh, what, to obtain an election of a president that is sitting. It has never been done before in that sense. Uh, is now the time for that conversation? Is, is now really a time to have that debate? Maybe that can help also in helping people accept the process. Well, I would rather say I'm looking forward to the time when challenge to elections will not be a matter for the courts. Mm. Right now, the election petitions is really destroying the integrity of the courts and the time available for other litigants. We are spending too much time on election petitions. When, when you look at the issue of limiting the time, we've had elections of turned before under the old electoral law three years after somebody has served as governor. That's the one that concerns the current um, it, presidential candidate of the Labour Party? Yes. When he was governor? Yes. So the problem, people, that is why people converse that we should limit the time when elections, petitions are had, so that somebody will not take undue advantage of being a fraud on the seat. So the argument cuts both ways. When you look at the time limit, but the time, so the issue really is that Election petition is a, we call it sui generis. It's a special form of litigation. It's not, so, it's not the ordinary one. What a lot of things go on there that are not normally present in the normal court system. So what we need to do really is a situation where we can clean up our hearts that people will more, be more willing to accept election resource as declared rather than everybody going to court for every little infraction. Because I've seen some of the people that have gone to court and I said, what is the hope? Somebody, we have people who are number 10 or number 12 coming to court to challenge, to obtain the results of an election. And I said, we are, so we, we have to change, the politicians really have to change their mindset. And then we also do not want a situation where somebody just said, let me just win at whatever cost since the likelihood of his being might not be upturned anyway. Exactly. But, you know, uh, the politicians will say it's the people's mandate. The people, people gave me this mandate. It was stolen from me, so I need to get it back. But even if it were to be decided before May 29, there's still another level of appeal, the Supreme Court, right? That's so right. does he still make... I mean, they can go to the Supreme Court, and that might take a longer time. So saying it should be done before May the 29th, is it feasible? Because there's still another level, the Supreme Court. It's not feasible, clearly, so... Uh, to start with, if anyone wanted us to finish with the petition, uh, petitions before the 29th, that means those who filed the petitions should not have exhausted 21 days in filing. They probably should have filed two days after the results were announced. Then the other party can then be said, can then be told, well, because the petitioner filed within two days, file your response within two days as well. But you remember there was that controversy about the Beavers inspecting the Beavers and all of that, which they said, well, took them extra time. They had to even go to court on that that's, particular that, one. That's so there we go. So that was not their fault. That was not the fault of the respondent. Mm. So who's going to pay for that? So we, we're not, we, we shouldn't be in a rush. But one thing I can tell you is, if at the end of the day, the decision goes this way or that way, it gives us an opportunity to re view the Electoral Act again. That document should be a dynamic one, an, an organic document, right. until when we finally get it right. Otherwise, we should be ready to move back the date of the primaries and move back the date of the election. So that by the time That'll we're done, time. we have elections, maybe for example in September, by the time we're done, then we're ready 
for May 29th. Very interesting uh, proposition, but final words. Just one sentence from both of you. How you expect Nigerians to handle this and the political players, how you expect them to conduct themselves outside of a court? I'll start with you, sir. Yes, thank you. My, my appeal to the politicians of the general public is that they should invest that trust in the judiciary, that they are working under extreme conditions and they should trust the system. You cannot, when you go to court, somebody is going to lose. That is just it. Okay. So whoever loses, should accept it. If they want to appear, of course, they have the right to do so. But people should not start inputting other motives behind the judgment. Right. Mr. Dilola, final words. Well, um, I'll agree with my learned colleague, but I just add that everyone should begin to realize that we cannot um, burn down our country because elections have not gone our way. Someone who's someone's going to win at the end of the day when with the election tribunal finishes. It might just be the winner today, the president-elect, uh, president who might be told, the, oh, well, you haven't won, so get up from the seat. It might be the one who has come second who might be told. But whatever the decision is, just like my learned friend has just said, let us accept the result. And then we have a duty to speak to those who represent us at the National Assembly mm. to see how some of these things can be amended to ensure that we don't have, we have less room for controversy. And it's not rocket science. It is isn't rocket science. Oh, well, I, I definitely enjoyed this session. It makes me feel like studying law, but maybe too late in the day. I'd like to thank you so much, gentlemen, Mr. Kaya Adilola, Senior Advocate of Nigeria, as well as Mr. Dili Kerbola, also a Senior Advocate of Nigeria. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much. So that's been the program, everyone. We're waiting for the courts uh, to resume tomorrow. We'll be there for you live to give you all of the angles. So stay with Channels Television. Till then, I'm Kaya Adilola. Good night. Stories. Simply log on to channelstv.com, click on podcast, select the program of your choice, and listen. Our podcast is available on Apple, Google, and Spotify. Tap the expertise you trust. Touch the stories that touch you anytime, anywhere. Mommy, it is time for us to leave this old place. One of your errands is missing. No one will find it. I'm not willing to take that chance. I have a big plan. What do you want? I want a senior position at the bar. If anything happens to me, go through.